All right, good morning. I think we'll get started. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, we're really excited to share with you um, just the, the excitement of what we have uh, done in the first quarter with your students and the, um, the thoughts and plans that we've been dreaming up for the next couple of quarters. And that's the fun part about being on the ground floor of opening an upper school is being able to take the traditions that have come before in Great Hearts and then Western Hillsify it. Um, and bring um, the the culture and the the tenor of the student body to the the events and the classroom order the, and culture that we create. So, I want to first introduce um, those people who are important to your child's life right now. Outside of their teachers, of course, um, this is Mr. Graylin Griffin. He is the dean of students, um, and if you are student ever sees him, I want you to know the person that they come to see. So typically, if a student, let's say, falls out of class, is really struggling, having a tough day, tough day at the locker, has even a, just a social interaction that doesn't go well, <clears throat> they'll see Mr. Griffin. And it'll be more about a conversation around, how can we make some better choices? How can we live differently? What can I do to help you find your way forward in the community of students or with the teachers that you are working with? Um, and sometimes it's going to be a tough love, a tough love conversation, and sometimes it's just a listening ear. Um, but I want you to know who the people are who are conversating with your child. A lot of what we do is try to pull from the stories and literature that the students are reading, characters that they're reading about, and talk about some of the same things that those characters struggled with. Um, and it kind of, some of them have to do with maybe um, members fictitious members of their house that represent their house their house characters um, and talk about some of the struggles that they had. It's the beauty of a great books program. Um, this is uh, Ms. Mignola Kochi. She is the assistant headmaster for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. She's going to talk a little bit about academics today. And then our athletic director, Ms. Elizabeth Disney, and she will talk a little bit about the things we've been dreaming. She and I have been talking a lot about sports and trajectory going forward. So. Um, I would love, to, he's going to step out. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wanted to share, first of all, um, just a little bit of, I think there's a lot of questions about what is this house system thing that you're doing? Um, and I don't know how many of you hear from your student. I hope that you hear from your student that there's um, something amazing going on and, and that's happening in little pieces all throughout the day um, while they're here. Um, and I, I actually wrote an essay that I that in my in a way to convince the teachers before we started the year as to why we should do this. So I'm going to read just a little piece of it because I think that it will help you begin to get a picture of what it is that uh, your student is involved in. So the modern house system had its beginnings in academic institutions in the early Middle Ages. Students who desired an education would gather in a city where a master teacher was living. With this master, they would share a house and devote themselves to study. The master not only taught these students their academics, but also mentored them as they grew in virtue. These gatherings of students were the foundations of the great universities of Europe. Today, the term house refers simply to the groupings of pupils. A family within the larger academy community and the members of each house are there to encourage one another to do their best in all noble endeavors. And to these who selflessly give to the advancement of and for the sake of the glory of their house, such an intentional culture is a vigorous incentive stimulating them towards truth, goodness, and beauty to tangibly put into practice much of what they glean from their studies of great thinkers, writers, and speakers. So there's just a, a little piece of the purpose behind why we put together a house system. Um, and it's, it's built around the idea of that we want to teach, exhort, bring accountability, leadership, and challenge in the form of relationships. And so by, by uh, we are a large school, um, and we are under the umbrella of, the, of as Spartans, but, but being a part of a smaller family nucleus gives you the ability to be, make other relationships and build bonds with teachers and students in a way that you may not have if you didn't have this other smaller identity and something that you are working alongside with and for. Uh, similar to how you would be if you were on a sports team. So for a lot of students, they won't ever go out for sports. 
but there's a desire and a longing to identify and belong to something bigger than you and fight for something, you know, do something courageous. So we give them uh, opportunities throughout the day to be fighting for this identity that they have. So over the course of the year, all students in the house, formally and informally, contribute to their houses flourishing and success. In addition to their place within the cultural life of the school, providing occasion for mentoring and encouragement, houses also compete throughout the year in a variety of activities. Reflecting the holistic life of the school, houses will engage in contests centered around school spirit, academics, sports, and more. Points, while never the main focus for their conduct and successes, will be awarded throughout the year, with the highest achieving house ultimately winning the annual house cup. So we do have a house cup, and it uh, is not quite displayed out there. If you saw above, above the, uh, the uh, reception desk, it's sitting on the floor. We have a house cup, and we also have it's the Cordial of Athalos, and it's a, it's a created award that is a combination of both Middle Earth and uh, Narnia. So our houses are built around C.S. Lewis's The Narnia series and uh, Jared Tolkien's The Hobbit. Uh, the students do read almost all of the books out of the Narnia series before they, they finish high school. And they do read The Hobbit. Um, and if your student was missed it, um, because they would teach it in sixth grade, um, then that's something that they might want to, to pull out and read. So the characters, each of the houses is created on a character, and then each of the houses have created a lore. So they've created, uh, based off of the stories, based off of the, the uh, traditions within those books and those characters, they've created a, a lore. So they might say something along the lines of, uh, talking mice are valiant and they would never allow their tail to be uh, removed so that's a way in which we have a lot of honor and a lot of pride and so sometimes we might I might walk in the hallway and say mice scurry off to class and so we're just using some of those <clears throat> things that remind them of who they are and they're fun and they, it's another way to say I have a bond with you and I know who you are and what your identity is um, they compete on Fridays during their Lyceum, um, and sometimes it's an inner house competition where uh, younger Baggins play against older Baggins. Um, these we've got the house of, of Frodo, which is our fifth and sixth graders, and then we have Bilbo, who are our seventh and eighth graders. Um, and sometimes they compete against another house, and then they, is, if they are in their then they have that opportunity to compete. Um, so they're doing those sort of activities, and we spent the first quarter just kind of getting to know each other. And through these smaller groupings and doing some of these activities, playing amoeba tag as, as the House of Baggins or playing uh, Capture the Flag as the House of Reepicheep against Pevensies, they've had all kinds of fun and they've also learned a couple of things that were hard. Losing. Lots of them. There's this house pride and it was so exciting to see it. So having kids come in before pickup and there's actual crying or frustration. <laughs> there was even... Um, there was accusations of cheating. And we've been able to now have those conversations with students around those kinds of things that they're always going to deal with as adults. And so we're creating a, a small microcosm in which those things are going to happen and it's okay because we're going to talk through them and we're gonna deal with them and we're gonna learn how to lose with dignity and win uh, without crushing other people's spirits. So. Um, it's been an exciting first quarter. We've built a lot of relationships. So students are in their section, and then they're also part of a house. So they've got more than one group of people that they associate with. Um, and we're hoping to build, through that culture of the house system, a mentor program. So in the spring, our eighth graders will have the opportunity to nominate themselves uh, as a, to, to be a potential uh, mentor as a ninth grader. Uh, they will get two, have to get two uh, recommendations from a teacher. Um, and they will have to just write a short little by a two paragraph essay as to why they would like to be a mentor. Um, and then we will spend some time teaching them what are some of the things that a mentor does and how would you have these kinds of conversations. And then next uh, fall, we'll do a short retreat with those students who are selected as mentors and they will help with our new student orientation day. And we will do that for sixth graders and they will help uh, a little seminar on how to keep your locker clean. Another little <laughs> seminar on how to have a conversation with your teacher about grades. Um, another, uh, maybe one would be how to maneuver uh, a relationship with a friend when they say something that you don't like. So we're going to help them become and take on the leadership role and it somewhat replaces, it replaces um, a need for a student council. 
So we would rather our students grow themselves as mentors and as leaders in a way in which they serve their school community instead of being on a board that makes demands of the school. Um, so uh, our goal, and as we grow this, is to um, create in them a real love and affinity for their fellow uh, human beings, and then also a respectful way of working and dealing with adults, um, and, and making requests in a respectful way, or coming alongside an adult and collaborating on something. So that, that, is, that is our end goal with the house system. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about now that we've begun to build this positive student culture, we've built uh, a lot of procedures in, into the school day. So you've probably heard a lot about my student has to be on time. My student has to uh, could get an infraction for being late. They can be an infraction for uh, being rude to somebody in the hallway. We would call that uh, hallway uh, disorder. Um, they could get an infraction for materials for materials we're not coming with everything they need in a way in an effort to teach them uh, we gave them about three weeks in the beginning before we gave out the the, the in first infractions every infraction is counted in uh, a system we have on the computer and when they reach five they they get an detention it's not a big deal it's part of helping them to go whoa I don't like this consequence I'm going to do something to rebuild that habit um, and if they don't seem to be getting that message and they constantly are getting infractions and then detentions for things like tardy, Mr. Griffin will have a conversation with them and bring in their house consul and say, what can we do to talk about why it is that you can't seem to get to class on time? They have six minutes between every class period, um, and that is an extra, extra minute than, uh, than the last school that I was at. Wanted to make sure students had plenty of time. They have the time to go to the bathroom. So I think you've probably heard maybe about, oh my goodness, we got four bathroom passes at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. Those are bathroom passes for, I'm in the middle of class and I didn't do what I should have done to try to get to class early so I put my books down and go use the bathroom and now I need to use one. They're supposed to be for those moments in which you didn't plan for. Uh, they have, they have uh, those six minutes between every class. If they go to a class, they get their stuff in their locker, they go to a class, they know they have three minutes left and they're going to use the bathroom. They can actually say to the teacher, I'm going to use the bathroom, I'm afraid I'm going to be late. And she'll say, take the pass with you. As long as you're quick about it and you're not that, you're not that late, I'm not going to give you an infraction. So it's the, <clears throat> teaching them to make those interactions and think ahead. So they have that opportunity to use the bathroom between every class. Um, and then, of course, they have the four bathroom passes for the first semester. They'll get a fresh set. For every house pass they, they don't use, bathroom pass they don't use, they will get a point for their house. And it, it's in a way for them to encourage them to be thoughtful. Um, so I don't know how many of you have been to, you've been to a wedding, or you've been to church, or you've been to a lecture, or you've been to the, the symphony or a concert, and you keep watching these adults getting up constantly throughout the whole thing to go use the bathroom, and you thought, I used the bathroom when we had time to come for, and I don't need to get up and go. It's that idea of making those, being prepared for where it is you're at, you are, um, so that it would be a rare occasion that you'd be so rude as to get up in the middle of something that was important um, to, to, to the person who was presenting. So we want to help them to be responsible, be thoughtful, be forward thinking, and be planners. Um, and that goes along with you know, the way in which they, they plan their studies. A lot about first quarter was being organized. How do I care about my grades? How do I know whether or not I'm doing well? How do I talk with my parent? What happens if I become ineligible to play sports? So we've had a lot of students um, that struggle first quarter, uh, and Ms. Disney will talk a little bit about eligibility, um, but we've already seen after fall conferences and their first set of grades, the attitude of students on Monday this week, wow, they were just suddenly, there's this heightened sort of interest in their performance um, and a desire to do well. Um, that was noticeable on Monday, so that's really exciting. The culture around them that we're hoping to intentionally build is doing what we want. We want them to be scholars, we want them to be, have friendships, and we want them to do uh, extracurricular activities and be eligible to do those things. And then when you get into a bad place and you fall behind, how do I dig myself out of that? So Ms. Disney will also talk about how do they dig themselves out of, I'm now ineligible in math, what do I do so that I can be eligible in two weeks? Um, I'm going to turn over to uh, Ms. Kochi. She's going to talk to us a little bit about, about academics. Okay. How are you all today? Good. We are so glad you are here. 
I'm uh, especially glad that your <coughs> student is here at the school. And I especially enjoy seeing them in the morning when they're in that lovely mood of theirs and they smile. <laughs> like, oh, we're not awake. Oh, well, okay. So about uh, the <coughs> academics at the school, we work very carefully to uh, provide to our students the best curriculum uh, from Great Hearts. And, and to provide the best curriculum, we have to have one key ingredient, which is con consistent communication. And it starts with, with your student. Um, our students, um, they, they know when they enter the classroom what is expected of them. Seventh and eighth grade, they receive a syllabus at the beginning of the school year, which uh, you sign as well, and hopefully you have been able to, to read the syllabus. When, uh, when we came back after the first quarter, I told the teachers, please take out the syllabus and review key points with students. Review especially the homework aspect, right? Um, our students, uh, sometimes they don't complete homework because they think they have time to do it later on. And that is fine, but homework is a key ingredient that helps them cement what they have learned throughout the day. We don't give homework on accounts that they have never learned. The homework is always given on what is happening currently on that day. So it's important that they, even if they don't do it correctly, they try. And that's a conversation that I have with your students. I always say, even if you don't do it correctly, try, because that matters. That It shows that A, you are trying, and B, we know who needs help and for what reason. If, if, you, if you hide away, because you can easily hide, I can hide away too, then you will the teacher may not be able to know what your needs are. Mm -hmm. Coming back in the second quarter, we decided as a faculty that we need to have more robust uh, communication with students when it comes to their grades. We're not trying to hide grades from students or from the families. Let's, let's be clear on that. Mm -hmm. We also don't want to put the emphasis on the grades alone, right? Because I have seen it when students said, <coughs> I need to do this for a grade and that's it. Mm -hmm. And then where is that? moral formation that comes with that. Where is that responsibility of that I need to learn this for the sake of learning because it is good to learn. Um, I've been very lucky because I've worked for Great Hearts since 2006 and I took, I always say, I took a five year sabbatical because I worked in a private sector and I saw the difference and I said, oh, that's why I want to go back to Great Hearts because I'd like to, to discuss with the students why we do what we do instead of, we're doing this for a grade, because I know that grades will matter in high school, I know that. But we have to understand what role they play as well. So every two weeks, ask your ch child this, we'll start on November 5th. On that Friday on November 5th, ask your child, hey, did your teacher share your grade with you? Because we'll give it out to them in the paper. And if they say no, then you email me and just say, Ms. Coach, they didn't receive anything. But I'll make sure that I'll walk around to, to see that the kids are receiving their grade, their letter grade. And uh, the, not only going to see the letter grade, but they will see the division of that grade, right? Uh, major assessment and minor assessments, which means tests and quizzes. Then uh, daily assignments, which means classwork and homework. And uh, participation, which means how, how are you contributing to the overall learning? We do have students that are shy. They don't get punished for being shy. Please know that. They don't, because they can contribute in very meaningful way. Our teachers, uh, they organize their classrooms, not only in the lecture form. Lecture form is mostly 20 to 25 minutes long, because think about it, your attention will get away longer than that. There is group projects work, there is collaboration, the, um, there, and there is this rich discussion. Believe it or not, of your child, you may not be aware of that, but your child can come to school and look at me and straight in the eye and speak to me in a complete sentence. <laughs> and I do contribute this to our teachers. Because when I say they force them, it, I don't mean it, that they are punishing them, but uh, they make sure that your student, when they speak up in the classroom, they speak in a complete sentence. They don't grunt, they don't say, yeah, no, maybe, I don't know. Even when a student says, I don't know, the teacher does not give up and say, well, okay, the teacher goes to another student and says, do you know? They give the answer and then you go back to the student and say, now do you know? Yes, we'll repeat it. And that's, that's a good form of cold call and repetition. So, um, and we're also preparing the seven and eighth graders for their high school years and beyond high school years as well. Um, I, I can tell you this from experience. I have had students that 
when I went to college, they would call uh, our schools back when I used to work in Arizona. They would say, hey, college is so easy for us. And I've always asked, why? Why is college easy for you? Because it was not easy for me, besides having the language barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and they always would say, because you taught us how to study. And to teach someone how to study is the most difficult job you can do and the most beautiful gift you can give uh, your student. Mm. Because it is not done willingly, it's done against someone else's <laughs> <laughs> willingness to, 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 to gain those study skills. And how do we do those study skills? It starts with that homework. That's why uh, if you look at the um, family handbook, we clearly say how many minutes each a subject should take for your student. If you are a new parent to our school, do not get discouraged that, wait, Math supposed to take you 25 <coughs> minutes, but it's taking you an hour. It is normal. We are looking at that student that has been at Great Hearts for at least four or five years. When I say don't be discouraged, because <coughs> by the end of the second quarter, it is our hope that that student that has come here uh, as a new student is fully integrated as a Great Hearts student when it comes to, to uh, complete their assignments within the allotted time. Also, as a parent, I would encourage you to email directly the teacher and you say, you know what, this homework you gave, oh man, tears, screams, <laughs> three hours, we didn't sleep last night, yeah. help. <laughs> and the teacher will help because we're also very human. We think that, oh yeah, they can do this in 20 minutes. And then I bet teachers come to me and say, that homework, it would have taken them an hour. Oh, okay, that's, that's great. So now look for those emails because I don't know what to tell you, buddy. So uh, the study skills start with, with the homework. Start with a discussion. Start with that rich reading. Our seventh grade students and eighth grade students, they do not read novels or books uh, that a typical seventh grade or eighth grade student might read around here, or countrywide too. You, they, for example, uh, in seventh grade, uh, right now, students are reading uh, the play The Miracle Worker. And we know that it's about Helen Keller and how uh, the teacher helped her educate her. Uh, but also, in the background, we have the, the Civil War, which, guess what? It connects with what's happening um, in Texas history, right? Because Texas history is part of US history, and Texas was involved in Civil War as well. Right? And it also connects, believe it or not, with science. Because you might say, well, how does this connect with science, a miracle worker? Well, being an educator, and if you read that play, what Anne uh, does, the educator, uh, the patients, and she also does a lot of experiments with, with Helen. We do experiments in seventh grade because not only we're testing the patience of our student, but also we're seeing, okay, what solutions can you come to? It's easy for me to give answers. But if I give you answers easily, you will forget them within five minutes, and there is no lesson learned. Students come discover the answers on their own with the guiding of the teacher. So hopefully they can come and say, this is what happened. This is what I did today. Instead of telling you, Miss Coach, you had this dream. You know, I had this very weird dream last night. <laughs> I was on a field trip, all right, with the kids. Um, and. And so that's, and, and with Helen uh, Keller, for example, we see the self-discovery. This child now learns how to communicate even though she could not communicate at all. And I tell this to the students, you can always communicate. You have to find you, your way. I'll guide you, and you have to find your way. So these are the start study skills that we give our students that they gain uh, throughout their years here at Greathurst that truly prepare them for college, if college is the path for your student. Um, if you were my parents, yes, college is the path to everything, <laughs> you know. Um, so, and they also, our students that have gone to college have said, we're also rereading what we read in high school with you. My Antonia is a good example. And if you've not read this book, pick it up, read it for, for fun. Read a page at a time yourselves if you, if you want to. Um, and they read it in college and they said, thank you because I read it again and I read it with a different uh, perspective now. I understand better now. Um, so this is, this is what we hope and we try every day uh, to achieve with our students in terms of academics. I'm a very hopeful person. I'm hopeful because I have seen the results. I'm hopeful because I have been in the trenches and I'll continue to be in the trenches. I fight for your student. And I'm not the only one who fights for your student. When I say I, we all fight for your students. 
even when they don't want it. And I've said this to your child as well. I know you don't want this, but I want this for you. And my will is stronger than yours. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at me and say, well, you're like my mom. I said, exactly. <clears throat> so let's move on. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Coach. Absolutely. So along with our academics, uh, athletics is another <clears throat> one that I've, I know that a lot of parents <clears throat> would like to know more about what the plans are. So uh, Ms. Disney, go ahead and, and talk about that. Excuse me, I'm going to walk around this way. The sun is in <clears throat> Because you're shining bright. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. I feel shiny and bright. Hi, so I'm Coach Disney. Um, nice to meet everybody. I'm the athletic director. I also coach your seventh graders. If your seventh graders have PE, they're with me during the day. Um, so this year we started off with the intramural system. Uh, some of you are familiar with this. We started off with boys by football, and we started off with girls volleyball. And it's been pretty successful. The kids have had a lot of fun so far. Um, they've learned a lot. The, amount of improvement I've seen in their athletic ability, but also in balancing what it means to be, a uh, to be a student, but also be an athlete at the same time. And those time management skills have been amazing. This is what you can expect going forward for the rest of this year. So here soon we're going to be starting our winter sports. So for seventh and eighth grade, going through the house system as well, we will have basketball. While simultaneously fifth and sixth graders will be having soccer. So, uh, so fifth and sixth grade will have a little bit of a flipped normal season. And this is just because of our campus availability for fields and for courts, but as well as like our coaching avail availability as well. Um, ideally, what we will do is we will have the four teams for each sport. So there will be four, uh, excuse me, four basketball teams for seventh and eighth grade and four soccer teams for fifth and sixth grade. Our goal and what we're wanting to do coming into this winter sports season is out of our four, for our seventh and eighth grade, out of our four teams that we would have for seventh and eighth grade, we want to create one Spartan team. So we want the coaches to nominate a student who uh, shows academic excellence in the classroom, athletic excellence on the field or on the, on the court, and also shows behavioral excellence. So someone who is managing their time well, and we want to create that one Spartan team. And then for this year, what we would, uh, that Spartan team would do is they would get an additional time to practice with that Spartan team after their normal practices. So they would have a little bit more of a, a requirement of an expectation out of them, if you will. And then they would play against a couple other schools, such as the Great Hearts Northern Oaks, Forest Heights, Live Oak. And then I have contacts with uh, the Jubilee Charter System, so potentially some schools from there. That way they can get the experience of competition outside of just within their school because that is something that they have talked about and something that they are craving and they are wanting and we saw that after football and after volleyball they're learning that they can handle that responsibility with balancing all of the other things that it takes to be eligible. Fifth and sixth grade would still play here within themselves for this year but if we have another school such as <clears throat> Forest Heights reached out to us we could potentially open up for them to play a game or two against them. In the spring, we, they will flip. Seventh and eighth grade will have soccer, and the same thing, four teams, and ideally a Spartan team would come out of those four teams. Fifth and sixth grade will play a spring basketball season. So also with this year, what we're wanting to do, because as we grow and as we have a high school, we're going to have to fulfill things like strength and conditioning needs or fundamental clinics, because a lot of our students, we want to... We want to give the opportunity to all students to play if they have that desire to play. Um, and, but some of our students maybe have been able to play since they were fourth grade. And now some of our students are in eighth grade and they're like, man, that sounds like a really fun time, but I've never played football before. How do I throw the ball? But I want to play on this team. So having those fundamental clinics, but also having those strength and conditioning sessions mm -hmm. will allow us the opportunity to make sure our students can get the basic skills that they need and the fundamentals to play. But it will also allow them a space to gain strength, gain agility, and gain speed in a safe and constructed manner um, that is age appropriate for their abilities. Mm -hmm. So going into next year, what that will look like. Next year, we will actually enter into a league. We will enter into TEKSAL. The sports that we're hoping to offer would be fall. We would offer um, hopefully flag football for the middle school, but we've looked at doing rugby. Great Hearts as a whole in this district is looking at doing a rugby team for our um, school, uh, excuse me, for our district, which is really exciting. I'm from Kentucky, we have rugby there. It's a very exciting sport. Um, so hopefully that's something that we will be able to incorporate. We'll also have a cross country team, which is made state this year. They actually, as our only league team, they made state, they're running 
It's really exciting. You're over here shaking your head. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Yeah. I've, I've, already, I've already got my car packed. It's only Wednesday, and I have my car packed already to go to Austin yeah. Saturday morning. I'm so excited. Don't laugh at me. I'm not. It's so true. I'm enjoying it. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Um, so we'll have cross country, either flag football and rugby, and then we'll also have girls volleyball. Winter, we'll have um, basketball. And then the spring sports would be soccer. We've had a lot of people ask about baseball and about softball. Ideally, those are things that we would like to offer as well. It just really depends on the student interest as well and if we can garner up the team for that. And luckily in Teeksal, the softball and the baseball, a student who plays soccer, it's technically a winter to early spring sport. They can still play softball and, and baseball as well if they would like to do that. What going forward though, when we join a league, we have to be very mindful of what that league, what those league rules are. So, and we have to abide by those league rules. So for instance, in Teak Sal, it says, if you're not passing your class at a 70% or above, you cannot play. And you cannot, so for instance, let's say my report card comes out and I have a 69.5, Teak Sal says, I'm so sorry, we don't round up, you cannot play. But also, awesome job if you got that grade up within a week but you cannot play next week. You cannot play until the next uh, progress report comes out. So that's a four week mm -hmm. delay period for us, um, just with the way that goes. So academics are extremely important. Um, it's really dependent upon the school, on if the student can come to practice. It seems to have worked very well with us so far this year, with our students still coming to practice and being able to get the grade up. They, they were able to really time manage that. Um, so that would be something ideally going forward we would want to do. If our students can't handle that, then they won't be able to come to practice either. But they cannot play in a game. And it's very important that we understand that they cannot play in the game if they are under that 70%. Because if Teak Sal, when we submit the grades to them, goes, excuse me, but you had a student at 68, you now forfeited that game. You forfeited every game to come, and you are now ineligible to participate in regionals or state. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you were the first. So they, they take it very seriously, um, and that's why we also, well, not only that, but academics are first. We're in school for a reason. We're not in school to be athletes. We're in school to, to learn, but as well as we don't want to punish Speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in school to be an athlete. <laughs> That's actually why I went to college, was only to play yeah. intramurals. My dad was like, what are you doing? And I stayed for six years just so I could play intramurals. <laughs> oh I really did. Don't tell your students that, though. <laughs> it cost a lot of money playing intramurals in college. <laughs> um, going forward as well, how this will look for next year. So 7th and 8th graders, we won't have intramurals for 7th and 8th graders next year because they'll be playing on a league team. 5th and 6th graders will have the intramural house system. Sixth graders will be able to try out for the seventh and eighth grade team. And if they make it, wonderful, awesome. Um, we're so excited for that, and that's where they will stay. Uh, but when we are in the league, we do play to win. So your sixth grader may make the team. However, your sixth grader may only see five minutes of a game. And we have to understand that when you are in a league play, you do play to win. Uh, but we do expect their full participation in practices and so on, because that's where you learn to get better. And I can speak from experience my freshman year. I, the bench was my best friend on that <laughs> soccer team. Uh, that was, me and the bench were best. I had a little mat and everything with my name. <laughs> but it was okay, I showed up to every practice. I had the dedication. I was able to have that conversation with my coach. How do I get to be the person that just at least gets into the game, even if it's the last three minutes of the game? <coughs> how do I get there? Um, and it really allowed me to figure out how to communicate, but also to have a work ethic. So that way, the next year when I was a sophomore, I was a starting varsity player. Um, so that's the goal of that and going forward. I know you all might have questions. Are there any questions that you might have? I've said a lot of information. Yes, ma'am. So um, the teachers, um, I know they know all this information, right? But, what, yes. Okay, so the reason why I'm asking is because I know sometimes it's important for the kids to get their work back to see the progress they've done or what they are missing. So are they going to make sure that the work is given back in a timely manner? So yes. that way they know, because I know I've run into cases where he hasn't gotten his work for a few weeks, and he's like, well, I don't know what grade I got on this project or this work, so that's, that's so, pretty much what I'm going to say. I'll let you answer here. Yeah, so I, I mentioned this briefly. As I said, beginning okay. of second quarter, students every two weeks, they get their grade from the teacher personally. Mm -hmm. So it and holds. They will be grading and turning. <coughs> yes, all on absolutely. assignments. All, I mean, yes, not absolutely. The They're not just going to get a grade and say how I, right. I got this, okay. right? Because if the student says, I don't know how I got this, yeah. and then the bigger conversation becomes, why did the teacher not share the grade? Right, okay. right, okay. All right, so, I just wanted to make sure on that. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question. Mm -hmm. 
On a side note, and I know you all know this, every time your child has a test in 7th and 8th grade, a week prior they get a study guide. They have a week to complete the study guide that helps them towards their test. Mm -hmm. um, now that our blogs are up too, teachers will put that on the blog as well. Study guide is given out, the test is on this date. So, and in addition, um, students are asked to have a parent sign their test and return back. So if your child has never given you a test to sign, talk to me afterwards <laughs> and let's figure out what happens there. Because that has been a practice from the beginning of the school year that uh, they're signing. And now, uh, because teachers are seeing that a number of students are not returning back their signed test, then it's going to be half a point of their participation, daily participation. And I told them, you have to let know the students this, because they have to be aware instead of what just happened. I don't know what's going on. So, um, so uh, students know when they have a test because they get the study guide that reminds them daily that I have a test on this date. Mm -hmm. And uh, each subject, and I'm talking about math, history, science, um, Latin, uh, t uh, teachers give two or three tests per quarter just so you all know that. Quizzes, they happen uh, more frequent. Our teachers do not give pop quizzes, and I'm thankful for that, actually. As a person who didn't do well in pop quizzes, mm -hmm. I'm thankful they don't do that. But uh, quizzes do take place uh, frequently, especially in Latin, because they're vocab quizzes that take place either on Thursday or Friday. Anyway. Somebody was just um, on basketball and soccer. <coughs> they're going to be girl, four girls teams, four boys teams? Yes, okay. yes, ma'am. I know I saw your hand raised up. So actually, she kind of touched on it. Because okay. my question was in regards to the testing for the specials. But you said, like, the specials will get three You're talking tests. about music? Mm -hmm. Music, Latin, okay. those times. So Latin in seventh grade is not considered a special. Nor is music, for okay. that matter, for some reason. <laughs> okay. I know, but we're so used to the special, special right? Yes, okay. Uh, in music is a little bit more different because their big assessment, honestly, is the concert. Yes, okay. Right, so prepare students for the concert. Now the teacher does give quizzes, um, and they're playing quizzes for seventh and eighth grade on those recorders. Um, hopefully they're practicing a little bit at home. Maybe you banish them in the and you know in the backyard. It's okay. <laughs> Did you say eighth grade as well? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they are memorizing their pieces. They're playing by memory, and God bless Mr. Coase, because when I was a music teacher, mm -hmm. I did not have the guts to ask students to memorize pieces on the recorder. He's more brave than I am. Um, so that's their big assessment, but they do have quizzes in theory and in performance as well. Okay. Because music um, is, they have it every day, as you already know, for one semester. So in seventh and eighth grade, uh, if they have music, seventh grade, if they have music this semester, they are going to have PE next semester. If they have eighth grade, if they have music this semester, they're going to have drama next semester, am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's a drama performance as well. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen in January, and auditions start next week, apparently, mm -hmm. which makes me excited. So, oh, that, she had her hand <coughs> first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so right no, I mean, <laughs> on the music performance, so my son, sixth grader, is um, <coughs> doing math intervention during music. So he's very happy because he doesn't think he has to do this. <laughs> Uh, oh, concert. Mm -hmm. so he's how going that to work? do he's not, he's so really he's not going to music class because that's he's when he, he's being taken out of music. So, but he's not taken. Uh, so he has music either twice a week or three times a week, and I don't think they take him out of all music classes. Okay. It's, he's missing. He miss, miss, He's missing one music class. Okay. So that's he's going to perform. <laughs> yeah, learn those songs <laughs> because you're going to be up from possibly. <laughs> a big smile on your face. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, they don't miss all music classes, okay. it's just once per week. Thank you for asking that question, because that's an important question. Mm -hmm. yes. So you said they have drama next semester, yeah. but there's a performance in January. For the class that for has class it right that has drama mm -hmm. this, uh, year, this year. I get yes, it. Yes, okay, yes, sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, and they're doing, they're doing this, they'll have it in May. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah they'll have it in, yeah. yeah. Well, it, will it be the same performance for the? So this, uh, uh, meaning the same play, no. Because they're doing the Christmas Carol in ah, January. Okay. And they're doing the Christmas Carol in May. No, no, no. What happens? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so don't crush my spirit. Uh, okay. I'm not crushing your spirit. 
We're not having Christmas in July. Mm. I have another question for Christmas. Yes, sir. You didn't mention track, though. Aren't I'm you sorry? Guys, aren't you guys doing track? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. You will have track. Oh, yes, okay. thank you. And really track sure. will, ideally how that will work, because track is such a late sport, track would start oh. in about January or February, about one to two days a week. Mm -hmm. And then as the season draws closer, they'll pick up more days a week. Um, and ideally, track is such a, it's such a complex sport because you have running events, throwing events, field events, relays, distance, sprints, all of the above. Um, so what you can look for track is track with top potentially be a five day, four day to five day a week practice. And then, but your student wouldn't be expected to go every single day. For instance, if I'm a sprinter and a thrower, I go on the days that are meant for sprinters and throw a shot. I go two <coughs> days a week and then maybe to a third practice, which would be all of the events. And we're going to compete with the other schools also yes. with their track? Yes. Okay. So And takes out, so Texas is a little strange when it comes, I'm from Kentucky. And in Kentucky, I have this website, and there's over 100 events, like 100 uh, meets every single weekend for both cross country and track. And it tells me where it's at in Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee. And I can go wherever I want. And just Texas is not that way. Texas, no. and especially in this area, most of the track meets and most of the cross country meets you don't find up until you're in North Texas, close to the DFW area, mm -hmm. or if you're in West Texas, like around El Paso, which I love you all. We are not driving eight hours for a cross country or a track meet. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. just entirely too much. But too does, much it, does it have to stay within the charter schools? It and does so why not. why can't we go against other public schools? You know? So that's because of their league restrictions. Oh, so in Texas, okay. you have multiple leagues, for instance. So okay. TXAL is technically for charter schools. So when we mm. compete, we would only compete in the charter school league. Mm. If we were to go into another league, for instance, like UIL, which we could mm -hmm. definitely do, but then you're going to be pitted up against 5A and 6A schools, which we do not have the student body to match with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have the facilities to match with that either as well. Mm -hmm. and, and the requirements that are, come from it, we wouldn't be successful. Mm -hmm. And not just successful in terms of winning and being and how many points we could win. The requirements that they have, we would not be able to meet it because of the size of our school mm -hmm. and because of the population. Mm -hmm. So. It doesn't make much sense to go over there. So that's why. Because that's because they are in a different league. You're looking at in the San Antonio area alone, we have almost seven leagues mm, that you could okay. potentially participate in. And then looking at all the various leagues and who they're with and then where the centered uh, school location is, Tixao is the most attractive for us based on the amount of uh, competition available, where that competition lies, and the requirements of us. If we, mm. we, if we were to go into this other charter school league, which we could, all of those schools are on the far northeast side, completely opposite of us. And then the requirements that they have, it doesn't really quite make much sense in terms of what they want out of us um, in order to participate. And as well as they only have 15 schools, it wouldn't, the competition wouldn't be varied or very vast mm -hmm. for us. So, real quick, so I know currently, I think it's because it's intramurals, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the games are on the weekends. Do they ever, when we move into like the spring sports, will they ever be like during the week or? So right now, the games will still be on the weekends for the intramurals, and that's because of scheduling um, with referees and so on, because we have to go through outside sources of that. When we go into league play, you can expect the games to be during the week, okay. which, as well as that's going, I'm so thankful we're also doing Saturdays. We will have like maybe one or two Wednesday or Thursday, or excuse me, Thursday or Friday games, just based on the way fall or spring break and Christmas break and all that falls. Um, but going into next year when it's on the week, what you can expect is an experience from this from the past couple of years of working at a different school. Our students would leave school, say, at 3.30 or 4 o'clock p.m. They would travel out to wherever mm -hmm. that gameplay is, but then they're not getting home to 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. So they really have to learn those time management skills mm -hmm. of, on Wednesday I have a game. Mm -hmm. I probably need to do whatever Wednesday's homework mm -hmm. is the night before. But if my math teacher gave me homework Wednesday night mm -hmm. and it's due on Thursday, I need to be diligent about my lyceum time, my morning break time, or my or you know <coughs> my bus time. However, um, so that's another reason why we chose Saturdays right now because we're, we're still getting our students accustomed to what does it mean to be back into the school setting, mm -hmm. doing the homework and managing that time. And then ideally next year they'll be a lot more successful with that because. Sometimes in, in Tixal, you'll have two games a week. They'll go Tuesday and then Friday night, they have a game. Mm -hmm. It's it's can be a lot Intense. of time management, yes. Mm -hmm. And especially if they're playing sports. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so next year, we'll have some games. Okay. I was just curious. Who's my time place?
weekend sports, and so that's why you couldn't do any intramurals yeah. or anything like that. Yeah, so. I understand. That's a good question. I have a non-sports related question. Um, is there, especially moving in high school, is there any um, plans for like music, like actual instruments? Mm -hmm. Band. Band. So I know you're, okay. I have three degrees in music, because one was not enough, obviously. Um, I'll tell you this about band. In order to have a successful band program, not only do you have a that successful conductor, but this conductor it needs to be able to understand every instrument in that band, mm -hmm. right? And it's a multitasking job. And successful high schools, and I'm compared to my experience, has been mostly in Arizona and in Massachusetts. I, I still think of myself as pretty new in Texas, even though I'm entering my first year here. Um, successful schools that I've seen, public schools, is that you have the director that was quite talented and and he understood um, each instrument, meaning that he could fix it in a moment, like your trombone is off, uh, your saxophone, um, you, you're not playing correctly. I don't have that. That's, that's not my specialty, I'm gonna let you know. But they also had hired outside sources, uh, teachers that would give private lessons, uh, either after school or before the school, that prepared the students for the band. And so, um, I'm going to say that it will take a lot of effort, and um, I don't know if we have the resources at this moment. That's a reality. Even if it was just focused to like drumline or. <coughs> so I've seen in Arizona, we, we had uh, this gentleman that he did drumline with our fourth graders. Uh, and he was pretty amazing. So that we can do it as long as it's focused. But if you're thinking of orchestra wise, then um, I have to keep in mind. Uh, the, the hiring, and I have to keep in mind the uh, facilities and um, and the talent, right? It is, with all due respect, it is very difficult to find the good people out there. Mm -hmm. So I can be a conductor, and I have conducted the strings, by the way. I've done that because I had the background in college. But if a student ever came to me and said, okay, will you play this for me? I can do it. I, I was always able to tune for them and just say, okay, you're playing a wrong note here, but that was the extent of what I could do with the strings. I couldn't do anything else. So I would say, go to your private teacher, make sure you practice uh, this passage before you come here. So something like that's good. Yes, I can see that happening much easier because it's much more focused rather than the big orchestra. So it's please. something that it's, it's something that um, would be important as we begin hiring for the upper school is looking for that multifaceted teacher. Um, well, right now, Mr. and Mrs. Cost are both our, our two of our music teachers. Mr. Cost is also a math, math teacher. So he has multiple skills. He can conduct and he uh, can he play. Can play. Uh, so he has a lot, a lot of skills. Um, so maybe that translates into something along the lines of a, a string, uh, a, a, string, a string quartet, yeah. or things, things like that, some sort of club along yeah. that line. Uh, he was also in the process of, of purchasing ukuleles so that we were going to do like a ukulele club as just kind of a beginning sort of instrumental sort of thing. Um, so as we, as we hire, my whole goal is to find as many liberal artists. And usually when you find a liberal artist, that's a teacher who's gone to a liberal arts school. And they not only studied science, but they were also a part of the orchestra. And they gained those skills and now have that ability because they have also been teaching lessons while they were in college. And so they now have that experience. So that, that's, that's what we're, we're trying to do. Um, the interesting thing is that um, the, the, the landscape for a teacher right now is not a positive one. Mm -hmm. And the way that the culture has attacked teachers and made it difficult um, it, it, we, we were finding an extreme hiring shortage, not only, not only uh, charter schools and not only gray hearts themselves, but just in the, the teacher space altogether. They're just looking for completely other places. And when we look for a liberal artist, we're not looking for somebody necessarily who went and got an education degree. So if they graduated with a liberal arts degree, they could do anything. Because a place like Intel, they'll take a liberal artist because they will teach you how to do whatever fine-tuning thing they wanted. They just want to know that you had the ability to speak and to write. Um, so they now have this wide open place they could go and to look at going to a school uh, for very little money and in a, in a possibly abusive environment or a difficult one in light of COVID and all those things. It is difficult, but that is, that is, that is our goal and the, as a headmaster. When I go out looking for, and I go out recruiting, and I go out to the different colleges, 
um, looking for specifically for that person who didn't just go into a STEM track and that's all they did. What else did you do while you were there? What other skills have you gained? What other interests do you have? So, because all of those other interests feed and give us the ability to uh, have multifaceted uh, interests for our students. So, uh, a music program, a sports program, uh, a, a vibrant fine arts and, and club program all come based off of who do we have on faculty who have these other talents and gifts, and then what are the interests of our families and their students. Um, so we will be uh, putting out surveys um, to our, our parents and to our students to find out what are those interests so that we make sure that, oh, we have quite a few kids who are interested in robotics. Well, let's get a teacher who could do a robotics club so that we can do those, uh, do, do, and I have experience um, having those kinds of programs. Um, so that, that's on me uh, to, to, as we start looking for, and the hiring season starts in the next month. Um, already looking at recruiting packets for, for uh, candidates out of some of the East, East Coast schools um, that graduate liberal artists that would be interested in a great heart school. So I, as I hear the things that you are interested in, those are the kinds of things that I look for in my candidates. What else could you do besides teaching math? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, does does Great Hearts ever do anything, dance or cheer or anything in that area? So we typically don't. Um, oh, well, maybe a couple different reasons. Um, one would be that um, there's only so much that we can do here, and we we want to make sure that what we have chosen as the most important or our first priorities are done well. And when we, we, we begin to segment ourselves and do so many different things, um, and I don't think that, um, that a dance or a cheer really supports our overall mission and goal for our students. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. Um, pep squad is what I would like to see, an old-fashioned British pep squad that was a <laughs> male and female, right? Striped shirts, rugby-looking shirts, and... and megaphones and, and that will really come out of our, our, our house system. Um, just the, that whole point of a pep squad is only there to garner community spirit and not, um, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think we all know that even though there's a lot of wonderful qualities in a dance and gymnastics program, there's a lot that's just not great about it. And it doesn't bring out the best qualities in people. Um, so. Uh, I just don't want to go, I, that's not the direction that Great Hearts wants to go in, in putting our efforts and support behind. Uh, and it's perfect for an extracurricular thing outside of, of what is done here. Um, we have a lot of students who are in gymnastics and sort of competitive sort of dance kind of things, and they do that outside of here. Um, and, and those are great. One of the things about a Great Hearts school that, um, that um, is important to us is that we are not the YMCA. We are not the one-stop shop for every social and athletic and uh, spiritual and moral need for your child. Um, there are lots of opportunities and a lot of wonderful things. I've had parents come to me and say, we should do cotillion. Wow, that sounds really, really lovely. I mean, that, is, that would be fabulous, but that is, that is a lot of work that we would have to intentionally be involved in in a very specific way that would take away from the other good things that we're doing. So you know how when you're a jack of all trades and you do a lot of things kind of well and nothing really well? Um, I want to be careful that we don't, we don't, we don't um, overstretch ourselves. But through our house system, we've, we're, doing an we're teaching etiquette lessons. Oh, yes. And by the end of the year, your students will know how to eat a spaghetti meal without getting it all over themselves. Um, and they will, at their house banquet, they will eat a spaghetti meal. Um, and uh, they will know, learn how, they'll know how to pass the food around the table, how to use the tongs, how to use their fork, their knife, their spoon, their napkin, their placemat, and there will be house points uh, connected to the most amount of clean placemats for your house. So that's kind of how we do, we do that. So we do some sort of etiquette sort of things. Your students will learn the etiquette of how to go to a dance um, and how to, I think, can't see some people over here. I'm sorry. So they'll, they'll, they'll learn the etiquette of a dance. So I, this is just like a segue into events. Um, so our sixth graders, and you probably heard about the Fezziwig ball that yeah. Great Hearts Northern Oaks does for sixth graders. It's not really a ball, but it was just a kind of an easy way of, of, of naming it. It's actually uh, Mr. Fezziwig's office party, and it comes from the Christmas Carol. And it was 
so as you know, K through sixth grade students do uh, literature celebrations. And typically it's a literature celebration during the school day where they do two hours of, of fun and celebration of that. Well, in sixth grade, because in uh, the sixth grade is the last grade in the lower school, we were helping them graduate on to events that they would have as a seventh and eighth grader. And so we created this uh, Feswick office party to be something after the school day. And then we added a dance component to it. And then we invite the parents to it because we want parents to be able to see what does a dance look like at a great heart school. Mm -hmm. I'm a little nervous about this whole boy girl dance thing. Mm -hmm. um, so in our PE classes, we actually teach the students the Virginia Reel, uh, Mary's Wedding, um, and the Roger de Coverley, which are group dances. And they're family, Victorian family dances that don't require you to pair up with that boy over there that you really <laughs> don't want to touch, but you kind of like. So they get used to, in PE, touching the hand of every other person in class, but for, more focused on the footsteps that they're supposed to do. Um, so we teach them those in, in fifth and sixth grade. And then in sixth grade, they come to this uh, Fezziwig office party. We have a full meal. We recreate some of the events from the story. And um, there is an actual Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig. And the parents and the students are encouraged to dress Victorian. And a lot of them do. And then the students teach the parents the dances that they learned in PE class. And everybody dances together. The moms, the dads, and the students. And we all dance together. Um, so that's what that is. And so we will be doing that with our sixth graders. Our seventh and eighth graders, we typically do that in January because that's after they read the Christmas Carol. Um, our seventh and eighth graders, we will do a dance of sorts in the springtime. Um, and I had a wonderful, lovely student who came and asked me about wanting to have a winter ball. And um, I, she had done a three-page research on it and a proposal. It was fabulous. And I, what, I, what I basically asked her is, I said, can we postpone this to the spring? I'd like to do something in the spring. Um, and, and, the, and the major reason is, is because our, our student community is, is fragile. It's, it's just barely birthed. And they are beginning to learn to love and trust each other. Um, and to throw them into a dance situation in which there's a lot of nerves and expectations and competition between boys and girls, we didn't want to put them into that position too early before they had the maturity and the care and the love for each other to be able to come to that. And we also didn't have time to teach them all the dances. So in seventh and eighth grade, they, they do dance the same dances. Um, I would like to get to the point, so by the time they're ninth graders, they will, um, they will actually have some instruction in swing dancing, and they will they'll do swing dancing. So there's a lot of dances that we will teach them and they will do, because what we want to focus on is the joy <coughs> Of, the, of dancing in a community, not just listening to loud music and shaking your body, and, or standing against a wall and hoping that that person is looking at you, or going hiding out in the bathroom. Um, we want to actually come to an event where I don't have to feel nervous, because in PE, I danced with all those people at one point. Mm -hmm. And then we'll teach them, how do I go and ask uh, somebody to dance? And we actually make an instruction that you can't turn somebody down. And you can't, um, you can't dance with one person more than once. So if you've kind of liked this person over here, you can dance with them once, but you can't just dance with them. Um, so, and our faculty will come to those, and our faculty will dance with the students. So we have, a, we have a bit of preparation to do to get them to that point, make sure our students have had the opportunity to learn the dances we're going to use. Um, so we're going to do something in the spring. Um, but in, in place of the winter activity that this gal wanted to do, she is helping us uh, recruit um, two other um, sponsors from every other house to uh, help us create a winter house festival <clears throat> for seventh and eighth graders. Uh, so fifth and sixth will not be invited. It'll just be seventh and eighth <laughs> graders. Um, and so they, what they're going, the, uh, we are meeting this week to actually finalize plans. You're supposed to have recruited her, all yes, the girls. Yes. I, they're they are going to receive from me an invitation for tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, we're, we're going to get together. And so the basic idea was that there would, each of the houses uh, would need to create a booth um, in which they have a game or activity that students would come to. So the, the booth has to be themed around their house in an effort to build more of the house story and the house lore. Mm -hmm. And they had to build a game or activity. So it could be an art activity. It could be a game activity, something like food. that. It could be food. It could be something like that. Um, and then the booths will be judged. 
um, and on creativity, uh, the activity in the game. They'll be caught. At, they'll be asked to dress up in costumes that represent something about their house, um, and we'll have a costume judging contest. So that's going to be December tenth which will be on a Friday, so there's an early release. The students will be given all afternoon to set up their booths and get them ready. We'll do it out in the courtyard. Um, and then we'll have an evening of something like a Renaissance festival sort of feel, um, but, a, but a Narnian, Middle Earthian sort of festival. <laughs> um, so if you haven't already picked up the idea, Great Hearts people like to LARP, and we <laughs> enjoy Big dressing more. up and, and uh, reenacting <laughs> and enjoying and reveling in things that are Part of the Come this Friday to see us how we dress up. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so that's what that's one of the events that we have planned for the for the uh, for this fall for seventh and eighth grade. Eighth grade is doing the Beowulfathon on November thirteenth. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you haven't noticed that your uh, your eighth grader has been reading Beowulf, mm -hmm. it is a it is a one of the first epic poems that was actually written in English, in Old English. The prototype English yes. language. Yeah. Yes. So it's nothing like our English mm -hmm. language. Right, when it's actually fascinating because uh, Mr. White can read it. Yes. <laughs> and he will read a good portion of it. So Beowulf upon originally was, you read the entire epic poem from beginning to end in an evening all together as, as eighth graders. So it takes a long time. So we've divided it up into the most important sections of the story, and we will read that. There will be a meal. Uh, we will play the Viking game of Koob. Uh, we will also do axe throwing. I bought a lot of foam axes. We have a bunch of foam axes <laughs> and a bunch of little chickens. And they're going to be throwing axes at chickens. Um, and they will, there will be jousting. Um, and uh, it will be on the Blanco at Blanco State Park. It's right on the river. So a few kids end up getting a little wet. But it is a tradition. Uh, they have a wonderful pavilion that has a roaring fireplace. Um, and so we will... And a uh, kitchen. And a kitchen, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we will start, we have some parents who are already getting plans around the food. Uh, our food menu is rustic, but not quite Viking, because Vikings didn't have chickens or turkeys or corn on the cob or potatoes, but we're going to have those things. But we're going to make them eat them with our hands. Um, yes. And uh, so that's something for, for them to look forward to. We're looking into something for seventh grade to do. Uh, we were looking along the lines of a seventh grade hike. Uh, before it gets too cold. So um, those are some of the things we have on tap for, for going into the Christmas season. Um, we've got um, the Thousand Gifts Challenge coming up. Your student will be talking about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, uh, we typically do that in a house assembly. Uh, we will have several more Friday House of Competitions that will be happening, so you should hear about those. Um, lots of internal things that happen um, that the students hopefully share with you about. Um, we met with the, the, the seventh and eighth grade girls um, and just had, we had a girls lunch and we talked about just some of those things that girls need to know about yes. on campus when they have those special needs and they need to let a teacher know. So we had some of those kind of conversations. I'll tell you this, eighth grade went much more smoother than seventh grade. <laughs> seventh grade, I was dealt with questions that I was like, oh, I, what? <laughs> I did not know how to answer. <laughs> Adrian yeah. was more mature. Like, mm -hmm. Yes, well, and they wanted to know more things. They wanted to know more things about pop culture and yes. why can't we have purple hair and why we can't we have uh, green nail polish. And so that they, we had a lot of those interesting conversations. So uh, the boys have wanted to know why they got left out. Oh, so, yes. so we've let Mr. Griffin know that they need to plan a, a boy's lunch. Yeah. Um, just, just another way for them to get together as a, another smaller community and, and, and feel connected and mm -hmm. feel heard ask questions yeah for them to understand why why they had that because some boys don't know about those needs and mm -hmm. you know and make fun of it you know yeah. so yeah. I think they have to be known too to respect it you know like mm. so, so seventh grade boys are still asking me so when is our lunch at Miss <laughs> which and that's that's, that's all they want right that's all <laughs> yeah. they want the luncheon but they I'm, they need I'm, to know that it's got to be you know that I'm not providing food for you <laughs> I would <I'm> like <afraid laughs> cookies it, okay but you know Scones. I just want to make sure that they know <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. So we'll provide cookies and I just want to say thank you too for giving the girls a little symbol yes yeah that was really Ooh, what's appreciated. the symbol this yeah. is the symbol. So they just do they just do this and there's a there's a there's a bathroom pass for the ladies. They just grab it and go. It's called nurses pass. Yeah. Nurses pass. That's all they do. They and they, they, use, they nurses use the pass. nurses bathroom and 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 some lovely parents uh, donated a whole bunch of uh, feminine products, That's which was great. lovely. So they we have those for any nervous 
Yeah. Nervous gal. But I will tell you, the seventh grade boys have been very inquisitive because my daughter did say the boys, they keep asking, what, what was the meeting about? So, <laughs> oh, so mm -hmm. Mr. Griffin's going to handle that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Just like for me to know, or you should never find exactly. out. Yes, exactly. I use that to my advantage. Yes, yeah. You yeah. can be your principal. I'll tell yeah. you yeah. the meeting with them. Um, <laughs> thank you for being so intentional about all those events. It sounds beautiful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then it's just getting started, and I appreciate everyone's patience. We, we're still we're still thank dreaming the spring. Okay. We're still dreaming the spring season. So we have um, we have a lot of we have a lot of things on tap, and I just don't want to say here's exactly what we're going to do until we've got all of those plans in place but we recognize that seventh and eighth graders need outside activities outside of school um, we also uh, because we're so intentional about why we would do an event and what the event is and how well it's planned we just want to make sure that we have thought everything through really well and it's the best thing for this community at its time at this time um, so uh, we, we definitely um, do appreciate anything that suggestions and ideas that people have. Um, so we've had several parents who have shared uh, thoughts and ideas with us and that's been really, really helpful. Um, so I think there was another. I, yeah, I did have a question. Sure. Was back to the academics. For next year, yes. do you know maybe what electives look like for ninth graders? We are going to do a high school preview night, okay. December, oh, December 7th. Oh, I thought it was third. No, seventh. You're it right. December seventh. Um, third is the concert. Not only will we talk about uh, electives and things for um, what what where what is the track for ninth grade, mm -hmm. um, we will also talk about ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth. Mm -hmm. We'll also have um, the the uh, the district uh, college counselor who uh, resides in Arizona come and speak to you about what should you be thinking about, about college, and how does Great Heart student, how do they fare with the about 22 years of track record? How do Great Heart students fare in college? What kind of schools do they go to? What should they, you be worried about, concerned about? Um, and what can you expect going forward with your student as they move through the Great Hearts curriculum? Um, and how well are they prepared compared to their peers? Um, and those kinds of things. She'll be there to ask, um, for you to ask those kind of questions. So December 7th, um, even if you're a seventh grade parent, um, you're welcome to come, but it, it's just going to give you that idea and preview for what can I expect as a ninth grade uh, mm -hmm. parent and what can I expect from my ninth grade student. I know that everybody mm -hmm. is thinking, you know, is Great Hearts the place I want my high school student uh, to be mm -hmm. and so that they have the best, the best uh, foot in going forward? I have a question. Oh. When we do start having 9, 10, 11, 12, will it still be one headmaster for everybody or like 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, will it be one headmaster still or? So there'll, be one, there, the, so there'll be one headmaster for 7 through 12 and there'll be one headmaster for K through, uh, K through 6. So, uh, <laughs> so, so there, there will be one over, so this is the year in which there will be a split and there won't be one headmaster over the whole school. And there'll be one. There'll be an upper school, and there'll be a lower school headmaster. Okay. Yeah. I just was curious about the seventh and eighth, and then the ninth and eleventh as well. So then there'll be an assistant yeah. headmaster for middle school, and there'll be an assistant headmaster for for high okay. school. Yeah, yeah, yes. How does Great Hearts um, approach like the whole thing, like with the homework, like? letting kids be kids in the evening and just getting that time to really decompress. I mean, I was very academic growing up. I love to learn, love to study, and I see that my student is very similar. So she's, you know, she's just coming home and she's working hard for hours, yeah. being that we're new, yeah. and that's fine. But what's the culture as far as letting kids be kids and decompressing in the evening since it is such a very rigorous academic program? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a really good, really good question. Um, I know that, that philosophically, um, when, we, when we think about homework, homework should be uh, practice. So if it's a math or if it's Latin, it should be practice of what I did in, in class that day. Uh, in literature, it should be an extension of either I am reading to be prepared for tomorrow, or I am reflecting on the reading that we did today. Um, in history, it should be recounting in some way or reading ahead for tomorrow. So it never should be busy work and a lot of just extra sort of, well, it's, I gave, we did something in class today and you need something to do tonight, so let me create something. So there'll be some nights where your student may not have anything 
Um, but as we move forward, all of those things are in preparation. So as your student goes into ninth grade, they will be in a humane letters class. And a humane letters class is a two-hour seminar that is history, philosophy, and literature. And so they will be reading historical texts that will also be literature, like um, the, uh, the, the autobiography of... Are you talking about the, the, the American... <laughs> Uh, Frederick Douglass. Yes. So the life, the life, America. Of, the life of Frederick Douglass, which will. <laughs> Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> so, it's, so it's an autobiography. So it's literature, but it's also historical. Um, and they will read and discuss the. So there's a lot of reading preparation for the next day. So the, a lot of their work will be be reading in preparation for the discussion because the discussion will uh, be in a circle. So the the tables in the room are in a giant U shape in which the teacher actually, after posing some questions on the board for reflection, will sit down at the table and the students will lead the discussion. Um, and the participation is, is now much higher in the importance in the grade because if the student hasn't done the reading to be prepared to have the conversation, um, then that's going to be obvious when they come to class. So that's going to be a big portion of it. Um, and then, of course, the students will be moving up in math uh, and in uh, biology, chemistry. Uh, they'll get physics. Uh, so the homework assignments are based specifically on practice of, the, uh, of the, the concepts that were done in class that day or in preparation and not supposed to be just, well, you need 30 minutes of homework, so we're going to assign that. Um, and so I, what I found as a parent, um, so I've had two students who graduated from Great Hearts, that uh, because of the lyceum that the students have at the end of the day, if my son did a good job of using that lyceum time, he did not have that much homework at night. Um, so he did most of his, uh, like I had math <coughs> problems and I had, a, I had two science, uh, science pro uh, problems that I was working on. He got that done in Lyceum so that when he was at home at night, he did the reading uh, mm -hmm. for Humane Letters the next day. Um, and so I, I didn't find him, and he was in sports, doing work late into the evening because of that. So I felt like there was a great balance. I was actually worried at one point of they actually giving him enough homework <laughs> because he doesn't seem to be doing anything at home. And he would say, I'm just, I'm, I, I economize my, my lyceum so well. Um, so they don't allow the students to spend a lot of time talking in lyceum until the very, very end so that they are actually getting work done. So you've got a, when they're up in the high school, it is a, so our lyceum right now is a, almost a full period. So it's about a 45 minute lyceum period. So that's, that's a good portion of time. So if your student is coming home with a lot of homework, they're not using their Lyceum very well. Yeah. So right now they have a Lyceum. Um, so is it mandatory in the Lyceum right now to do the work? Is that pushed or is it, hey, we're in Lyceum, we're kind of like, hey, what's up, how are you doing? And then now let's get to work 20 minutes into it. Is that how no, it is? No, no, it's not. Uh, okay. So I'll tell you this, the big difference that I saw from uh, before break to yesterday mm -hmm. and, and Monday. Um, I always walk around during Lyceum and I would encourage students, hey, it's time to do homework. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I did it. Oh, I don't have a lot. Yesterday and Monday, almost every student, they have books out and they're actually working. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I thank them. Um, so they are the teachers. Here's it's required. It's silence. Yeah. Yes, it's required uh, for them to, to be silent because mm -hmm. even if you don't want to do work, it's not fair to your neighbor while they're trying to do work mm -hmm. and you're just chit chatting over here. Exactly. Right? Uh, however, um, I also cannot make your son or your daughter right. do your homework. Right. I can't. I can just tell you, please take out your homework yeah. and do it. But if they don't do it, I don't think at that moment I can say, well, if you do the homework, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah. Right? Because they will, they will find an excuse. As I said, the excuses are, I've done it, I don't have a lot, yeah. I can do it later. One thing about homework, and, um, and I think I talked to you a little bit about mm -hmm. this, ask your child to time themselves at home. Mm -hmm. Ask to say, you will give yourself this much time to do this type of homework. Tackle first what they fear the most. Mm -hmm. Don't start with the one that you will waste your time because you know it's not important. Um, or you know that you know this. Always, always do that. I've had students in the past, and I'm not saying you should do this either, but they would, they would tackle what was difficult, they would wake up at 6 a.m. Mm. to finish mm -hmm. when it was easy to, for them to finish. Again, that, that was their schedule. I'm not saying you should do this, you should wake up your child at 6 a.m. and they should start reading, for example. But always time, because I will tell you about 60% of the time students dilly-dally because they are 
they could be daydreaming, they could be thinking of something else, or they are so overwhelmed that why am I focused on this when I should focus on this and I should focus on that and I have this and, and my phone is ringing and I need to talk to my friend, oh wait a minute, my mom is calling me to do this. Mm -hmm. So that's why we time. Find a quiet place. Um, I lived in a very small <coughs> country and I, um, and I didn't have enough space to, but my parents made sure that I had my, my corner. It's a corner. So it doesn't have to be a room. If anything, I would say be careful if your child goes to their room to do their homework because <laughs> they might just be sitting there and mm -hmm. staring up the ceiling at the wall, yes. right? <laughs> a corner. And it can be a kitchen. Well, I don't know if the kitchen is loud, but it can be a corner that mm -hmm. you know they're focusing on that. Mm -hmm. Because I can tell this to your child what they, how they can do their homework, but if you can reinforce it at home, that's a study skill that is being gained. And the other thing that's really helpful during studying, and I've just learned this uh, as finishing a master's program, uh, putting classical music on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if, I am, if there are other people in the room, and I did put earbuds in, and I put on, they, there's like, a, you can get classical study music. Fabulous, it's not wonderful. That it's not that good. She's a music snob. I'm sorry. Yeah. So snob. put on, I put on classical music that, that it, it's not, uh, so if you put on music with boom, 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 it, it just, it, it gets you a little worked up. So <laughs> it's quiet, and it's background noise. It's kind of like almost having static white noise in the background. It helps. Uh, cut out all those background things, even sometimes the fact that your brain is going a mile a minute thinking about everything else other than what you're trying to read, it helps focus. And there's actual studies that talk about classical music. Uh, if you played it during your dinner meal, it would actually help with digestion. Wow. Um, and that if you play it at night, it will help yeah. you calm your stress and your anxiety and allow you to sleep. So there's so many positive benefits to uh, classical music. So I would suggest that if you're if you are, maybe you have several students at a, a table, at your dinner table at night doing homework, uh, putting on <coughs> classical music Excuse will me. help everyone, maybe even help calm a few fights. I think. <laughs> <laughs> How often is the R&R, because &R, I heard you talk about that in the beginning of the opening ceremonies, yeah. and I'm just wondering more about that. So typically it's on just before a holiday, at the end of a break. Um, so if you and the students will know when it is, um, well, it's a, they, know. they always they, they know. always know when it is. Oh, yeah, yeah, they'll let you know. So it's typically like if there's going to be a, a Monday holiday or just be before Thanksgiving. We had it before October break. It was the end of the quarter. It'll always be the end of the quarter. So it's usually before a holiday because we want to make sure that those students know that the holiday was a ho is a holiday. Okay. Yeah. Don't quote me, but I think we have about <coughs> seven or eight on our weekends. But don't quote me. For the year? For the year. Okay. I was thinking it was going to be more often. The reason why I'm saying that is because my senior has more homework, or my seventh grader has more homework than my uh, senior. So that's the laughing joke at our house, that he's laughing at her because he's a senior and she has more homework than him. But that's your, uh, I'm sorry, I don't want to open, that's your first year. Like, our first year with our son was just, it was, yeah. it was a nightmare. He was, let me just go back to my old school, let me go back. And I was like, no, yeah. just keep doing it, just keep I, doing it. Yeah. And now, it's like, we get home and it's like, okay, well, are you done? He's like, yeah, I did everything in Lyceum. Yeah, I already studied. I've got my cards here, you know, so mm -hmm. it's. It'll it go away. Better. It'll get better. You know, <laughs> I, and I get that. And I and I get yeah. that. And I'm not shy from academics. I love academics. Yeah. And I'd rather them not be on their cell phones. Yeah, so, yeah, that's you know, true. I understand all that. Like, <clears throat> like that, but yeah. I just want to see that she is getting some time to decompress. Yeah. Because right now. I and it's funny sometimes the decompressing, like especially with our little one, it's like give me a math. You know, that's her decompress because she's she likes you know, it, so or so she'll just own. start saying her poem, or mm -hmm. even with him, he'll start talking about the book, or you know, that's right. his decompression, mm -hmm. and he's still he's still learning. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that the decompressing is different now, where it's like mm -hmm. talking about. And he still talks about TikToks. I'm sorry, they still do that. <laughs> but you know, but there's also that. Okay, well, you know what? In that book, we learned that, and da 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 da. You know, so it's that's his decompression with us too. So that's good. And I, I guess they like also like our first year. Like if there was ever something that was just so overwhelming or like they're on the verge of tears, I'd be like, okay, stop. I'm gonna write you a note so you can talk to the teacher about this. Yeah. Like, yep. okay, do not keep. Don't don't cry over it. Like yeah. we can. You know, you try. So now, you know, and then you let it be, you know. Yeah, very, first and, year is Yeah, and very much so for the fact that if your child is struggling with math, or, and it's a math problem, and you're looking and thinking, 
I, I, this is beyond me. I don't want to teach it. We don't expect a parent to sit with them and do homework and reteach something that should have been taught at, at school. So if your st child is really struggling, uh, reach out to the teacher. Have the student reach out to the teacher. Um, you should not. It should not cause. Uh, a, a struggle in a relationship with you because you're fighting with your child mm -hmm. over, over completing something that's frustrating to them. That's not the goal. Mm -hmm. If there's a frustration at home, then that means the, pa the teacher needs to know that. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, uh, I always ask that, that parents just write a note, on, like she said, on the homework that just mm -hmm. says, you know, he attempted it for 30 minutes and I couldn't even help him. Mm -hmm. Students <laughs> should have notes yeah. for every single subject. So if your student comes home with math and they say, I don't know how to do this, they have a spiral notebook that the teacher has actually had them record all the practice problems and the process that they went through in class. Same with science, with history, with Latin, with lit comp, all of those classes. So the student should have a spiral notebook for every single subject. So if they're struggling with homework, the first question is, where are your notes? Yep. Be the first question. Yeah. Because the or first action is where's your book? <laughs> and that's the example <laughs> right there. Yeah. yeah. I many students go home and they don't bring their book and I said, mm -hmm. How do you expect to do your homework? Mm -hmm. Oh, I can call my homework body. Mm -hmm. Oh, well that is gonna cost you thirty minutes of your time because they're mm -hmm. gonna just go X minus two. What? X plus two? So okay. <laughs> Yes. I, I can say for my daughter, it's just learning how to take <coughs> notes. That's a big challenge because she's never really, she came from a very small school. So that's the struggle there. So if I don't know what she was supposed to do, but I have her in a program now, I'm hoping it works and I'll stay in contact with teachers. And, yeah. But I, I really appreciate the community of parents as well. It's been really nice. I've met parents in those various little sections. Yeah. And so that's, I, I appreciate you yeah. guys doing that for the parents. And if you feel as if your student is not coming home with notes, so the, what, what we tell uh, the students is board work equals notebook. Yeah. And the teacher, I actually did a PD on how do you teach and have your students take notes at the same time. Mm -hmm. Students don't take notes from you talking. They take notes from what you put on the board. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to teach a lesson and then say, now get out your spiral and copy my notes. I want it to be happening all at the same time. So we did a professional development on how do you do that in a seventh and eighth grade classroom? How do you okay. teach a, a, a piece of history and have the students take notes on it in a way in which they could use the notes later? Um, so, so that is, so if you feel as if your child's not, then, then please reach out to the teacher and say, I don't, the notes don't seem to make any sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do want to say thank you to Miss Jillian. I want to let you guys know. She responds to my email so quick. It's like, I love it. She is super nice and it's just, it's very yeah, perfect. Yeah. So just want to let you guys know she's Ms. Really, really good. Yeah. That. Yes. Thank you. We yeah. had, um, math homework yesterday and I guess they're supposed to do the whole page. She sent an email quickly saying, hey, just do the first two pages, not the whole thing. You know? So that's really nice. I Great. love it. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel so encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually do. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I know you guys teach the Socratic method, mm -hmm. discussion, and I know for a lot of parents who don't have any background in that, um, it's a new thing. Mm -hmm. Would you be open to maybe having some type of seminar for the parents where maybe the kids show us how? Because mm -hmm. even in, in communication on campus, off campus with one another, some parents don't know how to have respectful discussions and it would help us help the kids because yes. that's a new thing and you know it's, it's not a new thing it's an old thing yeah. but it's new to a lot of us and so I think it would be beneficial if we understood that foundation and it would help us have those discussions with our kids it would help us have those discussions with each other and as well as with admin staff so yeah. I was wondering if y'all would be interested in. Well, well Jennifer, you yeah. are a pro at this. So. <laughs> we, we've been we've been batting out batting around a couple different ideas um, about Socratic uh, seminar discussion. Socratic uh, discussion actually starts. It's it's a form of teaching. So you've got lecture. Lecture is I stand up and talk at you, and you try to take in what I'm saying. Socratic teaching uh, starts with a a question or starts with a problem. Uh, that needs a solution and then we discover it together. So then it's the teacher having to scaffold the right kind of questions that helps the student find and discover the answer. Or maybe all of us, maybe it's something, especially in literature, as you're reading something and you ask the right kind of questions, the students might actually come up with other questions and the teacher will say, wow, I learned something today too from the text. I've read this three times and hadn't found that. So it's a discovery method in which we are together going to learn. 
it hopefully helps the student become a lifelong learner. So in other words, they sit down and say, I'd like to know more about computer programming. So where do they start? Um, they, they have the ability to say, I know how to find the information for myself. Um, one of the, uh, John Milton was a, uh, was a wonderful uh, educator about 100 years ago, and he wrote a book called Seven Laws of Teaching. Yeah. And one th thing he said in there was, uh, a teacher should never teach something a student can learn themselves. Because then we are spoon feeding them, and we're not giving them the tools and the ability to learn for themselves. So, what we're trying to do is build habits of a self-starter, self-learner, um, and and uh, instead of standing in front of students, because I'd love to hear myself talk, and I love to talk to you about things. Uh, just because I teach something doesn't mean it's been taught. And so, well, the first thing that we teach students it starts in kindergarten with Socratic uh, discussion is that we, we expect that the student will track the speaker. So the first thing we say, oh, Johnny, I'm calling on you. And then we say, uh, class, please track Johnny. And everybody turns and looks at Johnny. Because now Johnny is in a discussion with a human being with his eyes. And he is now giving that person attention. Then we ask the students to learn to build off of what the last person said. So if I want to say something after Johnny, I can't just, I'm not just, my hand in the air now comes down and I'm going to listen because I need to build off of what he said. I'm not just waiting for him to be quiet so that I can say what I want to say because what I was going to say might change based off of what Johnny just said. So I need to say I agree or disagree with what Johnny said. So that's the next thing we teach students is to agree or disagree with the last speaker and then build off of what was just said. And, and because I agree because I disagree right. because so so we we're teaching those skills so that when they get into the ninth grade class and they're <coughs> having this <coughs> Socratic seminar, they can a student can turn and say, I really agree with what Mr. So and So just said, but I would like I, I have a question around blank or are you sure that or can you prove that to me? I also thought that, but I couldn't find any tech support for that. Or I disagree with you because in this piece that I'm reading on page 45, it says this, and I think the character is saying this. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're looking, that's the next thing, tech support. So where are you getting that information from? So if, if we're talking about Pinocchio in third grade, uh, why, why do you think Pinocchio didn't learn his lesson from the first adventure he had? Um, and so the student has to go to text. Oh. Billy is saying this. Can anybody find in the book where that is true, where it proves that? Um, so that's how Socratic discussion and seminar happens. So if the first thing you can do at your dinner table if you're having a conversation is make sure that everybody turns and looks at each other when they're talking and that we're really listening. And I'm going to build off of what the last person said. I can think about a lot of interpersonal conversations I've had with people and caught myself. I'm having this, and I can't wait for you. Hurry up and finish telling your story because I want to say something. And I'm not really listening to what they're saying because I'm just waiting for my turn to share my story or my connection to what was being talked about. Mm. But not deeply listening to the, what the person said. If we really deeply listened to what each person was saying, we would probably find ourselves in less conflict with each other because we'd probably find more common ground or at least the ability to say, I, can, I do hear what you were saying even though I disagree with it and I can do it in a way that is, that is building of a community and not tearing it down. Yeah, so Ryan and I have talked a bit about a couple different ideas, yeah. Yeah, so just to answer your question, and we haven't even talked about the spring, the lion's share of what we've spoken about has been just between now and the end of December for events, but one of our dreams for the spring or for the next fall is to have a night that's just for the parents of scholars moving into the upper school to get together and have some discussions that are facilitated by faculty around the text where they will get to experience what your scholars will experience in a seminar class. Um, so that's something that we have ready. and we're, I'm the most excited about that because y'all are going to get a window into what is being built from kindergarten up um, with your scholars. So it's going to happen. Um, just be on the lookout for more info. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't want to keep anybody. If you would, if you have any other questions, uh, if you are an eighth grade parent and you would like to help out or know more about Beowulfathon, 
Uh, Ms. Martinez, Ms. Leith, and Ms. Puentes are our spearheaders of that, of that project and are working on the collection of volunteers and sign up for things um, and all good things that need to come out of that. So please make sure that you see them if you're interested in helping with Beowulf. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. And help yourself to more scones on the way out. Yes, some coffee. Oh. <laughs>